The director of Mantrap, Victor Fleming, was having an affair with Clara. The press hinted that others were too. Clara advanced the careers of several of her friends, among them Gary Cooper. The newspaper stories endangered Clara's career because her contract, like so many others, included a morality clause. This scene was typical of the double standards of Hollywood under the Hayes office. Teasing the audience was acceptable. But Hollywood didn't approve of stars who practiced what they played. The press campaign intensified. You need a strain of stone or ice or something in you to be able to handle all that happens to a movie star, and she didn't have it. She was very fond of gambling, terribly fond of gambling. So the studio got her terribly in debt to them because she didn't understand money, of course, and she would lose 10, 15, 20,000 a lick at these gambling casinos in Nevada. The studio advanced her more and more money. Clara got deeper and deeper into debt. On top of all this, sound arrived. Clara was terrified of talkies. Louise Brooks, also having problems at Paramount, was ordered to join her for a voice test. So I wasn't told Clara was going to make the test with me. And I'd never met her. And I walked in uh, to the studio, and there was a big couch. And she was sitting in a corner of it, all curled up. And I sat down. She just began to talk. She knew all about me. She was telling me about how dreadfully Schulberg was treating her. And I said, well, what's he doing? She says, Schulberg sends Ruth Chatterton up to my house on Thursday. Ruth Chatterton, a Broadway star, had been told to improve Clara's voice. Clara didn't want improving. And she said, I beat it out the back door because uh, they make me feel so terrible that I, I uh, can't talk. Clara felt her background was more exposed than ever. Oh, please, ma'am, won't you sit down and listen? I can listen standing up. I do it with my ears, you know. And he told her her Brooklyn accent was awful, but it really wasn't at all. Sure. They'll make you think they're believing them while they're playing you for a poor fish. One of her first talkies was a remake of a Louis Brooks silent, Love Em and Leave Em. But you can't put anything over on me anymore. From now on, it's Love Em and Leave Em. That's me. Clara's troubles worsened. Her former secretary and closest friend, Daisy DeVoe, was charged with stealing from her. DeVoe got a year in jail. The trial was the most sensational since Arbuckles, for all the intimate details of Clara's private life came into the open. Drink, gambling, sex. Clara Bow pictures plummeted at the box office. Paramount canceled her contract. In 1931, she married Rex Bell and retired to his ranch. You spend all your youth, she said, all your energy to attain the thing you wanted more than anything else in the world, and when you get it, you find you don't want it. She was the biggest star. She was the biggest money maker in Hollywood, above Garborg, above them all. But as soon as Schulberg lost interest in her, that, of course, is when she began to slip inside her own head. Because Clara really didn't exist. She didn't exist off the screen. She manufactured this whole person. Hey, it's made of a lamp. Okay, Jerry, don't go away, folks. Don't go away. As Shakespeare said, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is absolutely the biggest attraction on the Midway. Clara made a comeback at Fox. It failed. I've had enough, she said. A sex symbol is a heavy load to carry when you're tired, hurt, and bewildered. 
And when she dances, when she dances, folks, she makes old men lose their canes and cripples blow away their crutches. She's red hot, folks, red hot in a dance that is instructive, up to date and educational. Think of it, folks, the biggest attraction on the midway. For what fortune when she makes us the most point of another? It was Clara Bow's last screen appearance. She was 26 years old. <laughs>